Memoirs of a Revolutionary by Victor Serge. This is the first half of the first chapter. World Without Possible Escape, 1906 to 1912. Even before I emerged from childhood, I seemed to have experienced deeply at heart that paradoxical feeling which was to dominate me all through the first part of my life, that of living in a world without any possible escape in which there was nothing for it but to fight for an impossible escape. I felt repugnance, mingled with wrath and indignation towards people whom I saw settled comfortably in this world. How could they not be conscious of their activity, of their unrighteousness? All this was a result, as I can see today, of my upbringing as the son of revolutionary exiles, tossed into the great cities of the West by the first political hurricanes blowing over Russia. On March 1st, 1881, nine years before my birth, on a day of shining snow, a fair-haired young woman, her face calm and determined, who was waiting near a St. Petersburg Canal for the passing of a sledge, escorted by Cossacks, suddenly waved a handkerchief. There was an echo of muffled, soft explosions. The sledge came to a sudden halt, and there on the snow, huddled against the canal wall, lay a man with graying side whiskers, whose legs and belly had been blown to shreds, the Tsar Alexander II. The party called People's Will published his death sentence on the following day. My father, Leonid Ivanovich Kibalchich, a non-commissioned officer in the cavalry of the Imperial Guard was at that time stationed in the capital. He sympathized with this underground party which demanded bread and liberty for the people of Russia and had no more than about 60 members and two or 300 sympathizers. Among those responsible for the assassination, Nikolai Kibalchich, a chemist and distant relative of my father, was arrested and hanged together with Zelyabov, Rysikov, Mikhailov, and Sofia Porovskaya, daughter of a former governor of St. Pe Pe Petersburg. In court, four of the five condemned to death defended their liber libertarian demands with dignity and courage. On the scaffold, they embraced one another and died calmly. My father had joined in the struggle, joining a revolutionary military group in the south of Russia, which was soon completely broken. For several days, he hid in the gardens of the oldest monastery in Russia, St. Lavra of Kiev. He crossed the Austrian frontier by swimming under the bullets of the police, and he went to Geneva to start a new life in a land of sanctuary. He intended to, he intended to become a physician but geology, chemistry, sociology, and philosophy also interested him passionately. I never knew him as anything but a man possessed with an insatiable thirst for knowledge and understanding, which, which was to handicap him during all his remaining years in the struggle for life. Along with the rest of his revolutionary generation, whose masters were Alexander Herzen, Belinsky, and Chernyshevsky, then a deportee in Yakutia, and also in reaction to his religious education, he became an agnostic after Herbert Spencer, whom he heard speak in London. My grandfather on my father's side, a Montenegrin by origin, was a priest in a small town in the Chernigov province. All I knew of him was a yellowing daguerreotype of a thin bearded cleric with a high forehead and a kindly expression in a garden full of bon bonny barefooted children. My mother, Vera Podorowskaya Frolova, born of Polish gentry, had fled from the bourgeois life of St. Petersburg and she too went to study in Geneva. I was born in Brussels at it, as it happened in mid-journey across the world because my parents, in quest of their daily bread and of good libraries, were commuting between London, the British Museum, Paris, Switzerland, and Belgium. On the walls of our humble and makeshift lodgings, there were always the portraits of men who had been hanged. The conversations of grown-ups dealt with trials, executions, escapes, and Siberian highways, 
with great ideas incessantly argued over and with the latest books about these ideas. In my childhood memory, I accumulated images of the world, Canterbury Cathedral, the esplanade of old Dover Castle above the sea, the dismal red brick street in Whitechapel, the hills of Liège. I learned to read through cheap editions of Shakespeare and Chekhov, and dozing off to sleep, I dreamt for hours of blind King Lear supported in his journey over the cruel wasteland by the tenderness of Cordelia. I also acquired bitter experience of that unwritten commandment, thou shalt be hungry. I think that if anyone had asked me at the age of 12, what is life, and I often asked it of myself, I would have replied, I do not know, but I can see that it means thou shalt think, thou shalt struggle, thou shalt be hungry. It must have been time between the age of six it must have been some time between the age of six and eight that I became the evildoer. Through this episode, I was to learn another commandment, thou shalt fight back. I was a well-loved child, the firstborn, but for some years I became inexplicably a delinquent child. With a devilish cunning, the criminal child worked his mischief as if he wanted to avenge himself against the universe and more cruelly of all against those he loved. The precious pages of my father's scientific notes were found torn up. The milk stored for supper on the cool of the window ledge was found dosed with salt. My mother's clothes were mysteriously burnt with matches or else slash, slashed with scissors. Ink was surreptitiously spilt on newly ironed linen. Objects disappeared without trace. Nobody could intercept the hands of the criminal child my hands. I was harangued at length. I was admonished. I often saw my mother's eyes fill with tears. I was beaten too and punished in a hundred ways because my, pretty, my petty crimes were mad, exasperating, incomprehensible. I drank the salted milk. I denied everything, naturally. I melted into wretched promises and then went to bed in inconsolable grief, thinking of King Lear leaning on Cordelia. I became taciturn and introverted. Now and then the crimes would stop and life would become bright until the coming of another dark day, which I had learnt to expect with a vigilant inner certainty. Eventually, a time came when I acquired a sure foreknowledge of evil. I knew and felt inwardly that my mother's pinafore would be, would be dirtied or slit with scissors. I waited upon chastisement and lived amid rebuke and yet I used to play and climb trees as if evil had never existed. I had entered an unfathomable mystery. I had become wise. I carried the problem inside my head and let its solution ripen. The end of this episode, which I am sure made a deep impression on my character, left me with the most exalting memory of tenderness that I have ever experienced. I was about to learn that two individuals could, with a deep gaze and an embrace, understand one another utterly and conquer the worst evil. We were living on the outskirts of Verviers, Verviers in Belgium in a country house with a big garden. Two days before, some gross misdeed, whose precise nature I no longer remember, had cast a shadow over the household. However, I spent that particular day in the garden with my little brother Raoul. As twilight appeared, my mother called us back into the big kitchen, where, I, where a delicious smell of warm bread hovered in the air. First she busied herself with my brother, washing him, feeding him, and putting him to bed. Then she made the wicked child sit on a chair, knelt before him, and washed his feet. We were alone, lapped in an unforgettable sweetness. My mother looked straight up at me and suddenly, in a tone of reproach, asked, but why do you do all this, my poor little man? And then the truth flashed out between us, because a strange power was bursting within me. But it isn't me, I said. It's Sylvie. I know everything, everything. Sylvie was an older adolescent cousin adopted by my parents and living with us, a blonde and graceful girl, but cold-eyed. I had accumulated so many observations and proofs, and with such analytic power, that my headstrong, tearful exposition was irrefutable. The matter was closed with a full and permanent 
recovery of trust. I had fought back steadfastly against evil and had been delivered from it. My first great experience of hunger dates from a little later, at the age of 11. I recalled how one day in England we fed on grains of wheat prized out of the ears that my father had picked up from the side of a field, but that was nothing. We spent a hard winter at Liège in a mining district. Below our lodging, a cafe proprietor used to work. Mussels and chips, exotic odors. He gave us a little credit, but not enough, for my brother and I were, not, were never satisfied. His son would steal sugar to trade with us for bits of string. Russian postage stamps and various odds and ends. I became accustomed to finding exquisite delicacy in the bread we soaked in black coffee, which was well sugared thanks to this trade, and it was evidently good enough for me to survive on. My brother, two years my junior, eight and a half at that time, did not take to this diet and grew thin, pale, and depressed. I saw him wasting away. If you don't eat, I told him, you're going to die. But I had no idea what it was to die, and he even less so it did not frighten us. The fortunes of my father, who had been appointed to the Institute of Anatomy of the University of Brussels, took a sudden turn for the better. He summoned us to his side and we ate sumptuously. Too late though for Raoul, who was confined to bed, sinking fast, but fought back for a few weeks. I put ice on his forehead. I told him stories. I tried to convince him that he would get better. I tried to convince myself and I saw something incredible happening within him. His face became that of a little child again. His eyes glittered and grew dim at the same time, and all the while the doctors and my father came into the dark room on tiptoe. Alone together, my father and I took him to the cemetery at Ugol on a summer's day. I discovered how alone we were in this seemingly happy town and how alone I was myself. My father, believing only in science, had given me no religious instruction. Through books, I came across the word soul. It was a revelation to me. That lifeless body that had been bundled away in a coffin could not be everything. Some verses of Sully Prudhomme that I learned by heart gave me a kind of certainty which I dare not confide to anyone. Blue eyes, dark eyes, loved and lovely, exposed to endless dawn, from beyond the tomb, still see tight through their lids be drawn. In front of our lodging, there was a house topped with a finely wrought gable, which I found a, magnif which I found a magnificent sight. Golden clouds used to rest over it every evening. I called it Raoul's house, and often paused to gaze at this house in the sky. I detested the lingering hunger of the poor children, in the eyes of those I met, I thought I saw Ra Raoul's look. They were closer to me than anybody else. They were my brothers, and I felt that they were condemned. These feelings were rooted deeply and have remained with me. After 40 years, when I returned to Brussels, I went to see that gable in the sky on the road to, to Charleroi. And throughout the rest of my life, it has been my fate always to find in the undernourished urchins of the squares of Paris Berlin and Moscow, the same condemned faces. Oh, I lost my place. It was a great surprise to me that pain can fade and that we can go on living. Survival is the most disconcerting. I still think so. For quite different reasons. Why survive it? Why survive if it is not for those who do not? This confused idea justified my good luck and my tenacity, giving them a meaning, and for quite other reasons I feel even today linked to and justified by many of those whom I have survived. The dead are very close to the living, and I do not see them separated by some frontier. Later, much later, I was to revisit these thoughts again and again in prisons, in the course of wars, living amid the shades of those who had been shot without those murky inward certainties of childhood, barely expressible in clear language, being significantly modified within me. My first friendship dates from the following year. Wearing a Russian smock in white and mauve check, 
which my mother had just finished. I was going home along a country street in Ixels, carrying a red cabbage, proud of my smock and feeling a little ridiculous on account of the cabbage. An urchin of my own age, thick set and bespectacled, bespectacled, squinted at me sarcastically from across the road. I deposited my cabbage in a doorway and walked up to him, meaning to pick a quarrel with him by calling him bad-eyed. Glass face, goggles, want me to push your face in? <laughs> we measured each other up like the small gamecocks that we were, jostling one another's shoulders a little. Just you dare. You start, all without fighting, however, but forming from then on a friendship which was through all its enthusiasms and tragedies, never far from conflict. And when he died on the scaffold of, at the age of 20, we were still friends and foes. It was he who, after the squabble, came and asked me if I wanted to play with him, and thus established a dependence on me, against which, despite our affection, he ever afterwards rebelled in his inmost heart. Raymond Kellerman grew up as much as he could in the street, anything to get away from the stifling back room that was his home, behind a cobbler's stall where his father patched the shoes of the locals from morning till night. His father was a decent but broken drunk, an old socialist disgusted with socialism. From the age of 13, I lived alone, owing to the journeys and estrangements of my parents. Raymond often came to see, seek refuge with me. Together we learnt to forsake the tales of Fenimore Cooper for Louis Blanc's great history of the French Revolution, whose illustrations showed us streets, just like those that we haunted, overrun by sans-culottes, armed with pikes. Our favourite pastime was to share two sous worth of chocolate between us. Reading these gripping stories, they moved me particularly because their legends of the past lent substance to the ideals of men I had known of, I had known of since the first awakenings of my intelligence. Together, go, together though, much later we were to discover Zola's overwhelming novel Paris, and in an effort to relive the despair and rage of Salvat, crack down to the Bois de Boulogne after his essay in Murder. We wandered for hours through the Bois de la Combre in autumn air. Our favorite place became the rooftops of the Brussels Palace of Justice. We used to slip up by obscure staircases and, filled with joyful contempt, pass courtrooms, mazes of empty and dusty corridors, till we emerged in the open air and the light into a world of iron, zinc, and stone geometrically ordered in dangerous slopes. From there, we had a view of the whole city and the boundless sky. Down below in the square, the paving stones formed a mosaic of tiny rectangles, where a Lily Lilliputian carriage would be bringing a lawyer brimming with self-importance, bearing a tiny briefcase stuffed with papers that signified laws and offenses. We were burst out laughing. Ha, huh, what a misery, what wretchedness, what an existence, just think of it. He'll be coming here every day of his life, and it will never, ever cross his mind to climb up to the roofs to take a deep breath of air. He knows all the no-entry signs. He knows them by heart. He revels in them. It's what he makes his living from. But what moves us most and gives us the clearest lessons was the architecture of the city itself. The massive palace of justice that we likened to an Assyrian edifice is built just above the impoverished neighborhoods in the center of town, which it arrogantly dominates with its mass of carved blocks of stone. Two cities, the upper city, built in the image of the palace, smart, spacious, with its beautiful townhouses along the Avenue Louise, and down, be and down below La Marol, a jumble of stinking alleys festooned in laundry, teeming with snotty kids at play, rows in the bars, and Rue Blé and Rue Haute, two rivers of humanity. Since the Middle Ages, the same population had been rotting there, subject to the same injustice, within the same walls, with no way out. To complete the symbolism, the women's prison, a monastic prison of days gone by, stood between them on the slope between the palace and the lower city. The clogs of the prisoners, tramping round on the paving stones in the exercise yards, 
made a distant clatter. Up here, the sound of torture was reduced to a faint echo. My father, an impoverished scholar, had trouble maintaining his emigre existence. I knew him to be in close combat with the moneylenders. His second wife, worn out with childbearing and poverty, underwent terrible crises of hysteria. From the first to the tenth of each month, the household, which I seldom visited, ate reasonably well. From the tenth to the twentieth, less well, and worst off and worst of all, from the 20th to the 30th. Certain memories, already old, remained embedded in my soul like nails and flesh. For example, when we were living somewhere in the new district behind the Parc de la Cinquantenaire, my father, going out one morning with a cheap little coffin of yellow wood under his arm, his emotionless face, thou shalt seek to obtain thy bread on credit, on his return, he retired to the solitude of his anatomy and geology atlases. I had never been to school, for my father despised this stupid bourgeois instruction for the poor. It could not pay for a private education. He worked with me himself, not often and not well, but the passion for knowledge and the radiance of a constantly armed intelligence, never allowing itself to stagnate, never recoiling from an inquiry or a conclusion, shown from him so powerfully that I was quite hypnotized by it and went the rounds of museums, libraries, and churches, filling up my notebooks and ransacking encyc encyclopedias. I learned to write without ever knowing grammar. I was eventually to learn French grammar by teaching it to Russian students. For me, learning was not something separate from life. It was life itself. The mysterious relationships between life and death became clear through the very unmysterious importance of worldly goods. The words bread, hunger, money, no money, credit, rent, landlord, held in my eyes a crudely concrete meaning, which was, I think, to predispose me in favor of historical materialism. Still, my father wanted to make me take up higher education, despite his professed contempt for cert certificates. He spoke of this often, hoping to influence me in that direction. Meanwhile, a pamphlet by Peter Kropotkin spoke to me at that time in a language of unprecedented clarity. I have not looked at it since, and at least 30 years have elapsed since then, but its message remains close to my heart. What do you want to be? The anarchist asked young people in the middle of their studies. Lawyers to invoke the law of the rich, which is unjust by definition? Doctors to tend to the rich and prescribe good food, fresh air, and rest to the cons consumptives of the slums. Architects to house the landlords in comfort. Look around you and then examine your conscience. Do not understand that your duty is quite different to ally yourselves with the exploited and to work for the destruction of an intoler intolerable system. If I had been the son of a bourgeois university teacher, these arguments would have seemed a trifle abrupt and over harsh towards a system which, all the same, I would probably have been seduced by the theory of progress that advanced ever so gently as the ages passed. Personally, I found these arguments so luminous that those who did not agree with them seemed criminal. I informed my father of my decision not to become a student. The timing was lucky, a rotten end of the month. What are you going to do then? Work. I'll study without being a student. To tell the truth, I was too afraid of sounding pompous or of starting a great dis disputation of ideas to dare to reply. I want to fight as you yourself have fought. As everyone, sorry, I want to fight as you yourself have fought, as everyone must fight throughout life. I can see quite clearly that you have been beaten. I shall try to have more strength or better luck. There is nothing else for it. That is pretty near, pretty near what I was thinking. I was just over 15. I became a photographer's apprentice, and after that an office boy, a draftsman, and almost central heating technician. My day's work was now ten hours long, with the hour and a half allowed for lunch, and an hour's journey there and back. That made a day of twelve and a half hours, and juvenile labor was paid ridiculously low wages, if it was paid at all. 
plenty of employers offered two years apprenticeship without pay in return for teaching a trade. My best early job brought in 40 francs, $8 a month, working for an old businessman who owned mines in Norway and Algeria. If in those days of my adolescence I had not enjoyed friendship, what would have I enjoyed? There was a group of us young people closer than brothers. Raymond, the short-sighted little tough with a sarcastic bent, went back every evening to his drunken old father, whose neck and face were a mass of fantastically knotted muscles. His sister, young, pretty, and a great reader, passed her timid life in front of a window adorned with geraniums, amid the stench of dirty old shoes, still hoping that someday someone would pick her up. Jean, an orphan and a part-time printer, lived at Anderlecht, beyond the stinking waters of the Seine, with a grandmother who had been laundering for half a century without a break. The third of our group of four, Lucy, a tall, pale, timorous boy, was blessed, sorry, was blessed with a good job in the Linovation Lino Department store. He was crushed by it all. Discipline, swindling, and futility, futility, futility. Everyone around him in this vast, admirably organized bazaar seemed to be mad, and perhaps, from a certain point of view, he was right to think so. At the end of ten years' hard work, he could become salesman in charge and die as the head of a department, having catalogued a hundred thousand little indignities like the story of the pretty shop assistant who was sacked for rude behavior because she refused to go to bed with a supervisor. In short, life appeared to us in various versions of a rather degrading captivity. Sundays were a happy release, but that was only once a week and there was no money. Now and then we would wander along the lively streets of the town center, joyful and sardonic, our heads full of ideas, spurning all temptations with contempt. We were too prone to contempt. We were, leaning, we were lean young wolves, full of pride and thought, dangerous types. We had a certain fear of becoming careerists, as we thought about many of our elders who had made some show of being revolutionary and afterwards. What will become of us in 20 years' time, we asked ourselves one evening. 30 years have passed now. Raymond was guillotined, anarchist gangster, the press. It was he who, walking towards the worthy Dr. Gillotin's disgusting machine, flung a last sarcasm at the reporters. Nice to see a man die, isn't it? I came across Jean again in Brussels, a worker and trade union organizer, still a fighter for liberty after ten years in jail. Lucy had died of tuberculosis, naturally. For my part, I have undergone a little over ten years of various forms of captivity, agitated in seven countries and written 20 books. I own nothing. On several occasions, the mass circulation press has hurled filth at me because I, because I spoke the truth. Behind us lies a victorious revolution gone astray, several abortive attempts at revolution, and massacres in so great a number as to make you dizzy. And to think that it is not yet over. Let me be done with this digression. Those were the only roads possible for us. I have more confidence in mankind and in the future than ever before. We were socialists, members of the Jeune Garde. Ideas were our salvation. There was no need to prove to us, textbook in hand, the existence of social conflict. Socialism gave a meaning to life, and that was struggle. There were intoxicating demonstrations under heavy flags that were awkward to carry when you had not slept or eaten properly. And then we would see, ascending the balcony of the Maison du, du Peuple, the slightly satanic forelock, the domed forehead, the twisted mouth of Camille Hussmans. <coughs> there were the warlike headlines of La Guerre, La Guerre Sociale, Gustave Hervé, leader of the insurrectionist element of the French Socialist Party, organized a poll amongst his readers. Should he be killed? This was under a Clemenceau government when workers' blood was spilled. 
In the wake of the big anti-militarist trials, French deserters brought us the whiff of the aggressive syndicalist trade unionism of Pateau, Puget, Bruchu, Yvetot, Griff, Griffol, Lagar Lagardel. Of these men, most are now dead. Lagardel lived to become an advisor to Mussolini and Pitay. Men escaped from Russia told us of the Sviborg mutiny, of the dynamiting of an Odessa prison, of executions, of the 1905 general strike, of the Days of Liberty. The first public discussion I ever opened was on these topics, for the Excel's branch of the Jeune Garde. Our young contemporaries talked about bicycles or girls in a most loathsome way. We were chased, expecting better things both from ourselves and from fate. Without benefit of theory, adolescence opened up for us a new aspect of the problem. In a sordid alley at the end of a dark passage hung with gaudy washing, there lived a family we knew, the mother gross and suspicious, nursing the vestiges of her beauty, a lecherous elder daughter with bad teeth, and a stunning younger girl of pure Spanish be beauty, her eyes all charm, innocence, and softness, her lips like blossom. It was all she could do when she passed us, chaperoned by her dam, to manage a smiling hello to us. It's obvious, said Raymond, they're sending her to dancing lessons and keeping her for some rich old bastard. We discussed problems like this. Bebel's Woman in Socialism was on our reading list. Gradually, we found ourselves in conflict, not with socialism, but with all the anti-socialist interests that crawled around the working class movement, crawled around it and seeped into it and ruled over it and smeared dirt on it. The halting points on the routes of local processions were arranged to suit certain tavern keepers associated with the workers' leagues, impossible to suit them all. Electoral politics revolted us, most of all, since it concerned the very essence of socialism. We were at once, it now seems to me, both very just and very unjust, because of our ignorance of life, which is full of complications and compromises. The 2% dividend returned by the cooperatives to their shareholders filled us with bitter laughter, because it was impossible for us to grasp the victories behind it. The presumption of youth, they said, but in fact we were craving for an absolute. The racket exists always and everywhere, for it is impossible to escape from one's time, and we are in the time of money. I kept finding the racket, flourishing and sometimes solitary in the age of trade and in the midst of revolution. We had yearned for a passionate, pure socialism. We had satisfied ourselves with a socialism of battle, and it was the great age of reformism. At a special congress of the Belgian Workers' Party, van der Veld, young still, lean, dark, and full of fire, advocated the annexation of the Congo. We stood up in protest and left the hall, gesturing vehemently. Where could we go? What could become of us with this need for the absolute, this yearning for battle, this blind desire against all obstacles to escape from the city and the life from which there was no escape? We needed a principle to strive for and to achieve a way of life. I now understand in the light of reflection how easy it is for charlatans to offer vain solutions to the young. March in rows of four and believe in me. For lack of anything better, it is the failures of the others that make makes for the strength of the furors. When there's no worthwhile banner, you start to march behind worthless ones. When you don't have the genuine article, you live with the counterfeit. The co-op managers used to harass us. In his anger, one of them called us tramps because we were handling out, handing out leaflets in front of his shop. I can still recall our bitter, bitter sniggers. A socialist who used tramp as an insult, he would have chased Maxim Gorky away. I cannot recall why a certain counselor MB seemed important to me. I arranged to meet him. I was confronted by the very fat gentleman who was very keen to show me the plans of the delightful house he was having built on favorably priced ground. I tried in vain to bring him onto the ground of ideas, total failure, and to think that one needed to go beyond that in order to move onto the ground of action. Too many different grounds, and this gentleman had his 
duly listed in the land register. He was gradually getting richer. Perhaps I misjudged him. If he contributed to the cleaning up of a working class district, his passage through life would not have been in vain, but he was not able to explain it to me, and at the time I couldn't understand it. Socialism meant reformism, parliamentarism, and repellent doctrinal rigidity. Its intransigence was incar in incarnated in Jules Gesta, who made one think of a city of the future in which all the houses would be alike with an all-powerful state, harsh towards her heretics. Our way of correcting this doctrinal rigidity was to refuse to believe in it. We had to have an absolute, only one of liberty, without unnecessary metaphysics, a principle of life, only unselfish and ardent, a principle of action, only not to win a place in this stifling world, which is still a fashionable game but to try, however desperately, to escape from it since it was impossible to destroy it. We would have been inspired by the class struggle if someone had explained it to us, and if it had been a bit more of a real struggle. Instead, the revolution did not seem possible to anyone in this calm moment of abundance before the Great War. Those who, spo those who spoke about it did it so badly that it all seemed reduced to a matter of selling pamphlets. M. Bergeret was holding forth on the white stone. That principle was offered us by an anarchist. He to whom I am referring has been dead many years. His shadow lingers on greater than the man himself. A miner from the Borinage, recently released from prison, Emile Chapelier had just founded a communist, or rather communitarian colony in the forest of Soing at Stockel. At Egomont in the Ardennes, Fortuné Henry, brother of the guillotined terrorist Emile Henry, was running a similar arcade. To live in freedom and working community from this day on, we went along sunlit paths up to a hedge and then to a gate, buzzing of bees, golden summer, 18 years old in the doorway to anarchy. There was an open air table loaded with tracts and pamphlets. The CGT Soldier's Handbook, the, immor the Immorality of Marriage, the New Society, Planned Procreation, the Crime of Obedience, Citizen Aristide, Brian's Speech on the General Strike. Those voices were alive, a saucer full of small change and a notice. Take what you want, leave what you can. Breathtaking discovery. The whole city, the whole earth was counting its pennies. One was presented with money boxes on special occasions. No credit, trust nobody, shut the door firmly. What's mine is mine, yes? Monsieur TH, my employer, a colliery owner, issued all postage stamps himself. Impossible to cheat this millionaire out of ten centimes. We were amazed at the pennies abandoned by anarchy to the sky. A little farther on, and we came to a small white house under the trees. Do what you will over the door, which was open to all comers. In the farmyard, a big black devil with a pirate's profile was haranguing a rapt audience. A real style to the man, his tone bantering, his repartee devastating, his theme free love, but how could love not be free? Printers, gardeners, a cobbler, a painter were working here in comradeship, together with their women folk. It would have been idyllic, if only they had started with nothing, like brothers, they still had to tighten their belts. Usually these colonies collapsed quite quickly for lack of resources. Although jealousy was formally prohibited in them, quarrels over women, even when resolved by bursts of generosity, did them the greatest mischief. The libertarian colony of Stockel transferred to Boitsfort, spun out for several years. There we learned to edit, set up, proofread and print all by ourselves. Our paper, Communist, which consisted of four small pages. Some tramps, a short, prodigi prodigiously intelligent Swiss plasterer, a Tolstoyan anarchist, Russian officer, Leon Gerasimov, with a pale, noble face, who had escaped from a defeated insurrection, and the following year was to die of hunger in the forest of Fontainebleau, 
also a roundabout chemist from Odessa via Bu Bu Buenos Aires. All these help us to investigate the solutions of many a great problem. The individualist printer. Friend, there is only yourself in the world. You must try not to be a bastard or a ninny. The Tolstoyan. Let us by new men. Uh, let us be new men. <laughs> Salvation is within us. The Swiss plasterer, a disciple of Luigi Brittoni. All right, so long as you don't forget your hobnailed boots, you'll find those in the building sites. The chemist, having listened long, said in his Russo Spanish accent, All this is claptrap, comrades. In the social war, we need good laboratories. Sokolov was a cold blooded man, bolded in Russia, molded in Russia by inhuman struggles, apart from which he could no longer live. He came out of the storm, and the storm was within him. He fought, he killed, he died in prison. The idea of good laboratories was of Russian origin. From Russia, swarming through the world, came men and women who had been formed in ruthless battle, who had but one aim in life, who drew their breath from danger. The comfort, peace, and agreeableness of life in the West seemed inane to them and angered them all the more since they had learned to see the naked operations of a social machinery that no one thought of in these privileged lands. In Switzerland, Tatiana Leontieva killed a gentleman she mistook for a minister of the Tsar. Rips fires on the Garde Rep Républicain from the top deck of a bus in the Place de la République. A revolutionary trusted by the police executed the head of the Okrana's secret service in a hotel room at Belleville in a mean quarter of London called Hound's Ditch, a name appropriate to such squalid dramas. Russian anarchists withstood a siege in the cellar of a jeweler, jeweler's shop, the picture of Winston Churchill, then a young cabinet minister, directing the siege became a photographer's cliche. In Paris, Svoboda was blown up while trying out his bombs in the Bois de Boulogne. Alexander Sokolov, whose real name was Vladimir Hartenstein, belonged to the same group as Svo Svoboda. In his little room behind a shop in the Rue de la Musée, he had installed a complete laboratory just a few yards from the Royal Library, where he spent part of his day writing to his friends in Russia and Argentina in Greek characters, but in Spanish. It was a time of pot-bellied peace. The atmosphere was strangely electric, the calm before the storm of 1914. The first Clemenceau government had just spilled working class blood at Dravai in 1908, where police had entered a strike meeting only to shoot and kill several innocent people. And at the funeral demonstration for these victims where troops opened fire. This demonstration had been organized by the secretary of the Food Workers Union Métivier, an extreme left militant and police spy who the previous day had received his personal instructions from the Minister of the Interior, George Clemenceau himself. I remember our anger when we learned of these shootings. That same evening, a hundred of us youngsters showed the red flag in the neighborhood of the government buildings, willingly battling with the police. We felt ourselves close to all the victims and rebels in the world. We would have fought joyfully for the men executed in the prisons of Mont Jewish or Alcala del Val, whose, whose sufferings we recalled each day. We felt the growth within us of a wonderful and formidable collective awareness. Sokolov laughed at our demonstration, mere child's play. He himself was silently preparing the real reply to the workers' murderers. At the end of a sad train of events, his laboratory was discovered. He found himself hounded down without means of escape. Flight was impossible because of his face, notable for its intense eyes and, and conspicuous in a crowd because the top part of his nose had been crushed, apparently with a blow from an iron bar. He shut himself, he shut himself up in a furnished room at Ghent, loaded his revolvers and waited. And when the police came, he fired on them as he had fired on the Tsar's police. The peaceful sergeants of Ghent paid for the Cossacks' pogroms, and Sokolov laid down his life. 
whether here or there matters little, so long as one lays it down on the great day for the awakening of the oppressed. If nobody in this thriving Belgium, where the working class was becoming a real power, with its co-ops, its wealthy unions, its articulate representatives, could understand the language and the actions of frustrated idealists molded by Russian despotism, then how could a Sokolov do so? Our group was able to grasp it better than he, but not totally. He decided to defend him before public opinion and in court, which I did as a defense witness at the trial in Ghent. This campaign, together with many other instances, made our existence in that place untenable. Our group's propaganda was extremely uncompromising, for we, both, we felt an almost fatal spirit of defiance. It became impossible for me to find any work, even as a semi-skilled typographer, and I was not alone. We felt like we were in a vacuum and did not know who to turn to. We refused to understand this city, one where we could not have changed anything even by getting ourselves killed on the streets. In the Rue de Ricebroek, at the shop of a little grocer, cumbuck seller, who was suspected of being an informer, I had met Edward, a metal turner. He was thick set with the physique of some sideshow Hercules, and a heavy muscular face lit up by his timorous, crafty little eyes. He had come from the factories of Liège and was fond of reading Heichel's Riddle of the Universe. Of himself, he said, I was well on the way to becoming a splendid ruffian. I was lucky to begin to understand. And he told me how on the barges of the Meuse he had lived a ruffian's life. Just like the others, only tougher, of course, terrorizing the woman a little, working hard with the odd bit of pilfering from the docks, without knowing what a man is or what life is. A faded young woman, hair full of knits, holding a, f holding a baby, listened on, as did the old informer, while well, Edward confessed to me how he had become politically conscious. He asked to be admitted into our group. What ought I to read, do you think? Elise Recluse, I answered. Isn't it too difficult? No, I replied, but already I was beginning to see just how tremendously difficult it was. We let him join and he was a good comrade. Our times together were not clouded by the foreknowledge that he would die, by his own hand, close to me. Paris called us, the Paris of Salvat, of the Commune, of the CGT, of little journals printed with burning zeal, the Paris of our favorite authors, Anatole France and Jehan Rictus, the Paris where Lenin from time to time edited Iskra and spoke at emigre meetings in little cooperative houses, the Paris where the Central Committee of the Russian Social Revolutionary Party had its headquarters, where Bertsev lived, who had just unmasked in the terrorist organization of this party, Evno Azev, engineer, executioner of Minister von Plev, and of Grand Duke Sergei, and police spy. I took my leave of Raymond with bitter irony. I noticed him on a street corner, unemployed, handing out advertisements for a tailor's shop. Hello there, free man, I said. Why not a sandwich man? Perhaps it will come to that, he said, laughing, but no more towns for me. They are nothing but treadmills. I want to work or bust on the, on the open road. I shall at least have fresh air and countryside. I've had a belly full of all these dead pants. I'm only waiting to get enough to buy a pair of shoes. He went off with his mate by the Ardennes Road to Switzerland and the open spaces, helping with the harvest, raising limestone with masons, cutting timber with woodcutters, a floppy old felt hat over his eyes, a volume of fur heron in his pocket. Drunk with the world and with ourselves, we bring hearts of new men to the old universe. I have often thought since then that poetry was a substitute for prayer for us, so greatly did it uplift us and answer our constant need for exaltation. For Heron, the European poet nearest to the Walt Whitman, whom we did not yet know, flashed us a gleam of keen, anguished, fertile thought on the modern town, its railway stations, its trade in women, its swirling crowds, and his cries of violence were like ours. Open or break your fists against the door. Fists were broken, and why not? Better, than, better that than stagnation. 
Jehan Rigdes lamented the suffering of the penniless intellectual dragging out his nights on the benches of foreign boulevards, and no rhymes were richer than his. Dream lie, hope despair. In springtime, the smell of crap and lilacs. One day, one day I went off, all at random, taking ten francs, a spare shirt, some workbooks, and some photos that I always kept with me. In front of the station, I chanced to meet my father, and we talked of the recent discoveries on the structure of matter, which had been popularized by Gustave Le Bon. Are you off? Yes, to Lille for a fortnight. I believed it. I was never to come back, never to see my father again. But the last letters I had from him, him in Brazil, when I was in Russia, thirty years later, still spoke of the structure of the American continent and the history of civilizations. Europe at that time knew no passports, and frontiers hardly existed. I stayed in a mining village at Fives in Lille, two and a half francs a week, 50 US cents, payable in advance for a clean garret. I wanted to go down the mine. Some cherry old miners laughed in my face. You'd be finished in two hours, friend. On the third day, I had four francs left. I went to look for work, rationing myself. Every day, a pound of bread, two pounds of green pears, a glass of milk, Bought on credit from my kind hostess, twenty-five cents, twenty-five centimes to spend. Annoyingly enough, the soles of my shoes began to let me down, and on the eighth day of this routine, attacks of giddiness forced me to seek the haven of benches in the public gardens. I was obsessed by a dream of bacon soup. My strength was ebbing. I was going to be good for nothing, not even for the worst possible existence. An iron footbridge over the railway line in the station began to exert an absurd, an absurd fascination over me when I was saved by a providential meeting with a comrade who was supervising drain digging in the street. Almost at once I found work with a photographer at Armentieres a four francs, at four francs a day, a fortune. I was unwilling to leave the mining village and went out at dawn in the sad morning mist with the workers in their leather helmets. I traveled to work amongst slag heaps, then shut myself up all day in a pokey laboratory where we worked alternately by green light and red. In the evening, before fatigue could prostrate me, I would spend a little while reading Jare, uh, L'Humanité, with mingled admiration and annoyance. A couple lived behind the partition. They adored one another, and the man used to beat his wife savagely before taking her. <clears throat> I could hear her murmur through her sobs. Oh, hit me again, again. I found inadequate the studies of working class women that I had read hitherto. Would it, after all, take centuries to transform this world and these human beings? Yet each one of us has only one life in front of him. What was to be done? Anarchism swept us away completely because it both demanded everything of us and offered us everything. There was no remotest corner of life that it failed to illumine. At least so it seemed to us. A man could be a Catholic, a Protestant, a liberal, a radical, a socialist, even a syndicalist, without in any way changing his own life, and therefore life in general. It was enough for him, after all, to read the appropriate newspaper, or, if he was strict, to frequent the café associated with whatever tendency claimed his allegiance. Shot through with contradictions, fragmented into varieties and sub-varieties, anarchism demanded, before anything else, harmony between deeds and words, which in truth is demanded by all forms of idealism, but which they all forget as they become complacent. That is why we adopted what was, at that moment, the extremist variety, which by vigorous dialectic had succeeded through the logic of its revolutionism in discarding the necessity for revolution. To a certain extent, we were impelled in that direction by our disgust with a certain type of rather mellow academic anarchism whose pope was Jean Grave in Temps Nouveau. Individualism had just been affirmed by our hero, Albert Libertad. No one, no one knew his real name or anything of him before he started preaching. Crippled in both legs, walking on crutches, which he plied vigorously in fights. He was a great one for fighting, despite his handicap. He bore on a powerful body a bearded head whose face was finely proportioned. Destitute, having come as a tramp from the south, he began his preaching in Montmartre, 
among libertarian circles and the queues of poor devils waiting for their dole of soup not far from the, the site of Sacre Coeur. Violent, magnetically attractive, he became the heart and soul of a movement of such exceptional dynamism that it is not entirely dead even at this day. Libertad loved streets, crowds, fights, ideas, and women. On two occasions, he set up house with a pair of sisters, the Mahes, and then the Morans. He had children, children whom he refused to register with the state. The state? Don't know it. The name? I don't give a damn. They'll pick one that suits them. The law? To hell with it. He died in hospital, hospital in 1908 as the, result, as the result of a fight bequeathing his body. That carcass of mine, he called it, for dissection in the cause of science. His teaching, which we adopted almost wholesale, was, don't wait for the revolution. Those who promise revolution are frauds just like the others. Make your own revolution by being free men and living in comradeship. Hmm. Obviously, I am simplifying, but the idea itself had a beautiful simplicity. Its absolute commandment and rule of life was, let the old world go to blazes. From this position, there were naturally many deviations. Some inferred that one should live according to reason and science, and their impoverished worship of science, which invoked the mechanistic biology of Felix Le Dantec, led them on to all sorts of tomfoolery, such as a saltless vegetarian diet and fruitarianism, and also in certain cases to tragic ends. We saw young vegetarians involved in pointless struggles against the whole of society. Others decided, let's be outsiders. The only place for us is the fringe of society. They did not stop to think that, that society has no fringe, that no one is ever outside it, even in the depth of dungeons, and that their conscious egoism, sharing the life of the defeated, linked up from below with the most brutal bourgeois individualism. Finally, others, including myself, sought to harness together personal transformation and revolutionary action, in accordance with the motto of Elise Recluse. As long as social injustice lasts, we shall remain in a state of permanent revolution. I am quoting this from memory. Libertarian individualism gave us a hold over the most intense reality, ourselves. Be yourself. Only it developed in another city without escape. Paris, an immense jungle where all relationships were dominated by a primitive individualism, dangerous in a different way from ours, that of a positively Darwinian struggle for existence. Having bid farewell to the humiliations of poverty, we found ourselves once again up against them. To be yourself would have been a precious commandment and perhaps a lofty achievement, if only it had been possible. It would, it would only have begun to be possible once the most pressing needs of man those that identify him more closely with the brutes than with his fellow humans were satisfied. We had to win our food, lodging, and clothing by main force, and after that to find time to read and think. The problem of the penniless youngsters, uprooted or, as we used to say, foaming at the bit through irresistible idealism, confronted us in a form that was practically insoluble. Many comrades were soon to slide into what was called illegalism, a way of life not so much on the fringe of society as on the fringe of morality. We refused to be either exploiters or exploited, they declared, without perceiving that they were continuing to be both these and, what is more, becoming hunted men. When they knew that the game was up, they chose to kill themselves rather than go to jail. One of them, who never went out without his browning revolver, told me, Prison isn't worth living for. Six bullets for the sleuth hounds and the seventh for me. You know I'm lighthearted. A light heart is a heavy burden. The principle of self-preservation that is in us all found its consequence within the social jungle in a battle of one against all. A positive explosion of despair was building up in us, unbeknown. <clears throat> There are ideas, and behind these ideas, and the recesses of consciousness, where they develop as a product of repression, of denial, of sublimation, of intuition, and many other phenomena, which have no name, there is a shapeless, vast, often oppressive, profound sense of being. Our thinking had its roots in despair. 
Nothing was to be done. This world was unacceptable in itself and unacceptable the lot it offers us. Man is finished, lost. We are beaten in advance. Whatever we do, a young anarchist midwife give up her calling. Or sorry, we are beaten in advance, whatever we do. A young anarchist midwife give up her calling because it is crime to inflict life on a human being. Years later, awakened into hope by the Russian Revolution, I wanted to reach Petrograd, then in flames, and agreed to pass through a sector of the Champagne Front. At the risk either of being left there in a common grave, or of killing men better than myself in the opposite trench. I wrote, life is not such a great benefit that it is wrong to lose it or criminal to take it. Anatoly Franz gave voice to some of the most characteristic of these intuitions in his work, ending his great desire of the history of France. Penguin Island, with the appraisal that the best thing to do in the circumstances was to invent some devilishly powerful machine to destroy the planet so as to gratify the universal conscience, which didn't exist anyway. Thus, the literature of skepticism closed the vicious circle in which we were turning, and he did it out of kindness.